Varus and valgus. Um, we most commonly use these words in relation to the knees or the shapes of the lower limbs. And we kind of know what they mean, but when we look at different conditions and looking different sources, they seem to get used in different ways. I get a little bit confused. So I thought I would talk about the definitions of varus and valgus, and they're referring to most of the time long bones, but sometimes other bones, and how they're not forming quite the typical shape. So they affect the joint and they affect a bone. So we'll look at the definition and look at some examples and look at how the words get used in slightly different ways. All right. Okay, first of all, we're working in the coronal plane, like you've got a crown on top of your head. So slicing, slicing the body in this direction. So that would be the coronal plane. We're working in the coronal plane. And if we take the knee joint as an example, we're considering, okay, these, these bones are fine. We'll pretend they're a little bit bent. Um, we're considering a joint and a bone. And what we're doing is we're considering the bone that's distal to that joint and the distal most end of that bone that is distal to the joint. So if we take the knee as an example, the, this bone here is the tibia. If the tibia is bent such that the distal end of the tibia is more lateral than it might normally be, that would be valgus. If the tibia is a little bit more medial than it would normally be, that would be varus. But we are considering the joint and the bone and the distal end of the bone. So this would be um, the knee joint and tibia are varus if it occurs more medially and valgus if it occurs more laterally. Huh, valgus, that's got an L in it and lateral's got an L in it as well or a couple of L's. Maybe that's a good way of remembering it. That's the definition. Now the knee is known as the genu, Gen, genu, right? So in, in literature, if you genuflex, you go down on one knee, right? Uh, and a lot of structures associated with the knee have genu or geni associated with them, right? They're part, as part of their names. So if, if it's the knee that's affected and it's the tibia that's bowing out laterally, this is genu valgum. That is the distal end of the bone, distal to the knee joint, is curved out laterally. So this is genu valgum. Valgum. Well, that's, that's a different word to what we started with. What's going on there? Well, this is Latin, or really it's Neo-Latin. So it's different to the original Latin, anyway, language, right? But what we're doing is we're using valgus, Varum, uh, with a noun, uh, the joint, the name of the joint, and the word changes depending upon the gender of the joint name, whether it's masculine, feminine, or, 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 or neutral, right, or neuter, as you might have seen in other languages. We don't have this so much in English, but we do see it in French and German and so on. So uh, the, the word changes depending upon the gender of the name of the joint. Valgus, valga, and valgum are the variations of valgus. Valgi, valge, and valga are plural forms for when we're talking about both knees, because often um, there is symmetry and we see, both, we see the same thing happening on both limbs, on both sides of the body. So you see, there, there are, that's why the word varies depending upon the joint that we're talking about. I know the layman talks about, or may, you know, maybe talk about valgus or va varum deformity, but anatomically we talk about a specific joint and bone and valgus or varum. And when we look at these specific joints, the word changes, and that's why, because of language. Varus can become vera or varum if that distal bone is curved medially. That's the singular. Again, changes depending upon the gender of the joint. And very, vere, and vera 
if we're talking about both joints, that's the plural form. You get the idea. In practice, what we actually tend to do is we just remember the term for what's happening at each joint. So let's do a few examples of that. The shape of the lower limb and the positions of the knees can also be affected by the shape of the femur and the joint of the hip. These are coxa vara and coxa valga. Okay, so we're talking about the hip joint, coxa, uh, valga and vara. So the hip joint, this is the neck of the femur. This is the shaft of the femur or the diaphysis. This being kind of the long load bearing bit. This is the bit that's usually got a curved shape to it and is affecting the positions of the knees. This is the bone distal to the joint. This is the distal end. Okay, so if we think about the hip joint, if the femurs are curved so as to push the distal ends medially, that would be coxa vara, right? And if the femurs are curved so as to pull the distal ends of the femurs laterally, that would be coxa valga. Coxa, the hip joint, varum, valgus, medial or lateral. Now you can actually measure this. If you measure the, 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 the angle between the neck of the femur and the length of di the diaphysis, that's often a determinant as to the shapes here. Coxa valga, coxa vara. All right, what about the knees? So we already talked about this a little bit. So whilst the knees were affected by coxa vara and coxa valga, the deformity, the unnatural shape was actually caused by the femur and was related to the hip joint. Um, genu varum and genu valgum are referring to the knees directly so we're talking about the knees, knee joints now, and the tibia is the bone distal to the knee. This is the distal end. So if the distal ends of the tibias are more medial than they normally would be, that would be genuvarum. Uh, and look, you can see the knees are pushed apart there. This is a, a bow-legged appearance. Whereas if the distal ends of the tibia are pushed laterally, this would be genu valgum, and now look, the knees are pushed together, they are knocked together towards the midline. And we're talking that we're defining that, that, that term is defined by the joint, the bone distal to the joint, and the relative position to its distal end to where it would normally be where you might expect to find it. All right, and then we can do another one, we can actually go down to the ankle as well. So here, we're not actually really at the ankle joint. We're, we're interested in the calcaneus bone here. The talus is this bone here. It's the subtalar joint between the talus and the calcaneus. Now remember I said we've got to consider this in the coronal plane, so in this plane across here. And the calcaneus might be, it's easy to see from the other way around if I can twist you around. Um, I'll push you back a bit. The calcaneus might be rotated medially or laterally relative to the, the natural midline position. Um, so this is called, this is, this is a hind foot variation or a calcaneal variation. Um, so you could have hind foot varus, you'd have this calcaneus bone rotated medially, so hind foot varus or hind foot valgus if the calcaneus is rotated so it's pushing a little bit laterally. Calcaneal valgus or hind foot valgus. So the same principles apply. We're thinking about the subtalar joint. The joint distal to that is the calcaneus. And how is the, the distal end of the calcaneus presented? Is it curved more medially than you would expect or more laterally than would you expect? So hind foot varus, hind foot valgus. So as an ex, um, joint biologist. I've, you know, these are terms I've, I've used, I've understood, I know what I'm talking about, because some of these changes apply biomechanical changes to big joints, which can then lead to the development of osteoarthritis, right? Um, so it's a thing I've used, but I've never really understood the, devi the definitions. So I wanted to understand that, that a bit better, and I do now, and hopefully you do as well. Valgus and Varus. See you next week.